Good morning, everybody. Good morning from Delhi. A nice cloudy weather out there. 30th July, 11 a.m. in the morning. During these times when everybody is on Zoom and webinar, we took this opportunity and breathed through this pandemic. Still, is proud to have from a virtual living room conversation to a real living room conversation between two professionals who Stur and I personally have a lot of respect for Anne Feenstra and Gautam Bhatia. Both the professionals don't need an introduction. Architects, practicing architects, writers, critiques. Got a multi practice as an artist. We, we cannot be fortunate enough to have two esteemed professionals in Ani and Gotham to be sitting in Stir Studio and having a conversation which is not structured, but it has a lot of it is going to have a lot of in depth insights. They're going to talk about social cultural aspects, they're going to talk about the situation we are in and the shift in values keeping social cultural aspect and vis-a-vis -vis what architecture and design has to do in today's time and tomorrow. Ecology, sustainability, stories they love to tell, poetry, satire, writing they love to express. We're going to leave them talk to each other. The subject is of their choices. We're going to watch them inspire us and we're going to let you dive into the conversation of two professionals who are meeting for the first time but have been following each other's work for long. Welcome, Ani. Welcome, Gautam. Thank you. We can only be, we can only express a gratitude for you braving this pandemic and being part of this design center and studio called Stir. We're gonna leave while we are in the room, watch you converse with each other. We enjoy, you inspire the audience. Thank you. Namit, thank you. Thank you very much for asking me. It's a real privilege to, to be here and I've admired Ane's work from a, from a big distance and I've also known it Part of the admiration, I think, has to do with the kind of adventurous outlook that he has uh, and to be able to build in places which uh, are, for most architects, unbuildable and in, the, in mountain deserts and in, and in places where, as they say, no man has ever been. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think I'm, uh, um, I've always practiced in the safety of of an architecture community and within cities. So I, I find a lot of what, uh, what Ane has done is, uh, is inspiring partly because of the location itself and also for the kind of easy material uh, sort of renditions that he manages to put together in, uh, in uh, places like Afghanistan, in Nepal, and uh, and we all, I think, I have for for a long time I've been talking about sustainability, and uh, I've written numerous articles on it. But the actual practice of sustainability is not has eluded me. And I think, to some extent, what uh, what I've uh, found in your work is that it is it is done with great clarity and with with great ease. Uh, both things which are difficult in, in uh, the practice of architecture. And I think those are the things which, uh, which I think I would like to sort of know more about in, in when we begin to, begin to speak. Well, I'm, uh, I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm a normal human being. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a star architect. I don't want to be a star architect. I don't want to be famous. I just want to do my work. 
the way you think, Gautam, the way that you are able with your skills and with your talent and with your uh, knowledge slash experience to express yourself is fantastic. It's highly inspiring. Um, one is because you fundamentally question things. You have self-reflection. You look at yourself and you know where you are in, in the bigger kind of sense of things. I think Professor Doshi wrote a very nice uh, piece in uh, one of your latest book, The Blueprint, I think. Yes, but I, I have to interrupt. I had, I had to write that piece for uh, Mr. Doshi and he, of course, corrected it and, and changed <laughs> it around. So <laughs> it's a Well, he's in his 90s, so yes, we have yes. to forgive him. Um, then I think something that is very, very difficult for architects, or it seems to be very difficult for architects, is this kind of self-reflection and this, you know, it's an unheard word of uh, almost modesty. And modesty and architecture are really a difficult combination because everybody teaches you not to be modest. And then humor, the sense of humor and in a greater sense, enjoyment of exploration that is really hammered out of architecture, mm. big times, and it starts in education. I, I always tell my students that if you want to become an architect, uh, you need to have two things. One is you need to be curious. If you're not curious, then there are many professions who are very happy to take you because curiosity sometimes is a negative in, in other professions. Um, and the other one, I think, is uh, proactive. So the idea of, because you have been to a great school of architecture and perhaps you've done your masters in an even greater school of architecture, people are gonna walk into your uh, studio and gonna flood you with jobs and, and they're gonna all think that you're the most fantastic architect on the planet. That's not how it works. Basically, nobody will come, nobody knows you, nobody has worked with you. And if you study architecture, it doesn't mean you need to become a practicing architect. There are, it's, it's really, really, uh, I, I always get very, very happy when I meet uh, IAS officers or IFS officers or bureaucrats who are in the large machine of India LTD and they're doing their job. So many other uh, ideas uh, and yep. I think that was in a way for me the interesting thing about architectural education was that I came about it in a very roundabout way. Uh, mm. I started actually as uh, to study anthropology, cultural anthropology yep. and so a couple of years of cultural anthropology and then moved to uh, psychology which was uh, really the study of human behavior uh, and then eventually into into art, uh, art and sculpture to try and see you know how to make those, uh, those pieces of sculpture related to uh, the psychology of behavior. Yeah. Uh, so architecture actually encapsulated all these these things, you know, about culture, about behavior, and uh, and about art, and did it in a way which you know very naturally raised your bar yeah. of curiosity and yeah. made it uh, made it not fashionable, but made you think about so yeah. many things which fall effectively outside of architecture. Mm. There's a building which is called the house with the dancing windows. Yes, yes. it has these kind of. Yes. Kind of. So that's in the Afghan Pamir, uh, which is in Badakhshan. And Badakhshan, for Afghans, is the middle of nowhere. So from the capital, uh, Faisabad, uh, you have to drive 16 hours to reach the site. So this building is in the middle of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> literally. So how do you work there? Good luck, you did your masters in Delft. You had great teachers like uh, Herman Hetzberger and Aldo von Eyck, uh, terrible teachers like Rem Kolhaas. 
the guy could not teach. He was a really <laughs> bad teacher. Um, and then you're there in the middle of the middle of nowhere and um, they have snow leopards and they have blue sheep and, and Marco Polo sheep with these kind of curling horns. Marco Polo, of course, was the first to describe them. That's why it got the name Avis Marco Poli. <laughs> um, and I spoke by that time enough of Dari to converse, to be on the building site, uh, know the materials, the colors, uh, 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 etc., etc. Um, and then locally, they don't speak Dari, they speak, they speak Wachi, which is in the Wachan uh, uh, corridor, the Pamirs. So there you go, good luck. So our, uh, let's call him uh, donor or principal of the project. Um, <clears throat> we had done one national park in the, the highlands of uh, Hazariyat, the Bamiyan central area, 3000 yeah. uh, meters altitude. And that had come out very well. We had worked with the local people. Uh, it was being paid for by the Asian Development Bank, in this case then the donor. And they said, uh, can you also make the designs for the uh, visitor center and the gatehouse uh, in, uh, in the Afghan Pamirs? Because this is probably going to be the second national park of the country. And I said, yeah, it's a great job, why not? Uh, and of course, realizing it's really <laughs> difficult to get there. Um, <clears throat> and then I said, so where is there a site or whatever? They said, no, no, but there's a lot of land. Okay, so I went there, there is no site, uh, but my god, the, the Wakhan corridor, you know, if you, if you go high enough, you have the Kyrgyz and you have the, the Bactrian camels and whatever, it's just unbelievably beautiful. So I found myself on the second day in the middle of the middle of nowhere, walking around with the local king, they follow the Ismaili structure, and the commander in charge of the Wakhan corridor. A very nice man, uh, a military man. And our job was to find the site. And the people, you know, whether you speak the language or not, uh, I can draw, so you can also communicate in different ways and you can look at each other. And if you have intentions to kind of get to understand each other, you will. The best thing, of course, is falling in love. And that uh, who needs language? You just fall in love and that's it. Um, but I think there are many different ways of communicating with people and seeing what uh, can Once we, uh, some people say, why did you make this, I don't know, asymmetrical network diagram for the windows? Um, and we did use software to make it. Uh, I didn't scribble it kind of up. Um, but basically, if you look at those willow trees and if you look at the patterns of the stone walls that they built themselves, it's, it's yes. like, do you know Vonoroy? Sorry? Vonoroy? The no. Vonoroy diagrams. So Vonoroy is a guy from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He has studied, let's say, the, 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 the wings of, uh, of dragonflies and the patterns of, uh, of leaves and where Basically, as architects, we always draw in these kind of diagrams, yeah. right? And then this is this, and then, and then maybe here's the entry, and then maybe this is the garden, and then I don't know, whatever, this is maybe a thick wall. Yeah, but uh, Vonoroy actually uses uh, diagrams like this, always five sides. Um, so if you look at how Afghans in the Pamir make uh, their uh, because stones are stones. It's uh, it's it's you know it's erosion and then you cut them etc etc. So these stone walls they, they basically they, they they look like this huh? and there's not one stone that is the same um, and 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 it just keeps on going. So if you do your kind of your outer cut grid of your y-axis and your x-axis, you actually see that there is no single line in that whole stone pattern that is straight. Mm. So why would you cut the wall 
make your window and then say, oh, my window is going to be like this, right? I don't know. And then this is maybe an openable window. Why would you do that? Yeah. No, maybe, you know, you follow the, well, let me make it here, otherwise it's going to be a mess. It's a mess anyway. And then you say, well, let's continue this feast of, uh, it's great, no, to have these, uh, why can the window not be like that? And then, of course, there's always somebody who said, but how can you open a triangle window? <laughs> well, look at how they build ships. Look at how they build cars. What's the problem with an openable window? Yeah? It's not difficult. You need to kind of be very modest and say, what do I know as an architect? I'm not a carpenter. Mm. I need to find a carpenter. And then you organize a cup of tea. Cheers. Can I have one more cup of tea? <laughs> uh, and you ask these carpenters, who of you would like to make the ceiling of this building? Mm. Then they all say, I would like to do it, I would like to do it, mm. I would like to do it. Because people in general, they need a job, right? So then you kind of say, well, uh, can you show me a few things that you've done in the last years? And then if you're able to judge, uh, like Mickey, walk into a building and make a judgment whether you think that the person who has made this, can he make this what you have in mind? And then once they're up on the roof and they're making that ceiling, oh my God, it's just unbelievable. Mm. Highly crafted. Impossible to do these kind of things in the, what they call the more developed world. Now it's, uh, you know, again on this point that uh, uh, the creation of uh, mistrust mm. because the more you assert your private identity mm. in, in a building yeah. uh, the more mistrust you create with the local community yeah. uh, and to to a great extent what people uh, I think like what you do is yeah. to leave things open uh, you know when when a carpenter comes in and he teaches you what a local practice is mm. uh, and so I think in, in so much of what what we as architects yeah. need to do is to really unlearn the the sort of details of, um, of local craftsmanship and to yeah. rely on on uh, yeah. on the skills of you know that are available to us. Obviously, you know you can't do that in a major hospital or something where you uh, airport. But uh, I would like to try that. But, yeah, uh, I think to be open. Is, is one thing. Um, I think as an architect, you need to have a plan. You need to have an idea of what you want. Uh, in the teams in India or in, uh, in Kathmandu, we have a team called Sustainable Mountain Architecture. Uh, the first months for a new team member are always highly confusing because they're used that the senior will tell you what to do. Mm. It's like you get your morning instructions. Today you're going to do, I don't know, the bathroom tiles of this area and then you're going to do this uh, kind of things. And at five o'clock I'm going to check if you've done it. Wow. <laughs> yes. So, uh, what is that? You know, uh, I mean, that is, that is like production. Uh, so if you do a 27 story high high rise building somewhere in uh, Gurgaon, I think that's a method that works really well. Mm. Uh, but if it is um, something maybe slightly uh, more, uh, or let's, let's, let's be nice, let's call it that you need a different creativity for that. Mm. Um, why not engage that younger person in the design process? That younger person, I said, oh, the only difference between an intern and me is that I have a little bit more experience. I always feel very lucky that what I like to do is also kind of, you know, it's more hybrid with me. Yeah, yeah I mean, true. I can see in your, uh, in the way that you, that you draw and in the way how you express your things or, or the way how you challenge things, that you enjoy it you need to develop a sort of a facility of uh, expression 
yeah. which may not always be related to mm, you know uh, a visual medium yeah. uh, but you know there are certain things that are better expressed in writing there are some things which are which i think make more sense as as a sketch yeah. and uh, and maybe things which are better in photography uh, so i i think those uh, um, those uh, you know you in a way the subject in, uh, dictates what you do do with it and how you express it uh, yeah. uh, so what was what happened with me was many years ago when uh, uh, when i just started practice uh, in, in the uh, mid 80s we yeah. had uh, these um, three brothers from punjab who uh, came to the office uh, yeah. and uh, they had uh, brought the drawings of of uh, monticello jefferson's house in virginia yeah and they laid them out on the table uh, saying that uh, you know we would like you to build this for us in uh, suburban delhi yeah uh, so it was uh, at that time i was i almost instinctively knew that i wasn't going to build this house yeah but uh, but i w- did want to know you know why would these three brothers from punjab want to build thomas jefferson's house as their own family house yeah. in in virginia in uh, yeah in delhi uh, yeah. uh, and it the the curious part of it was that it the only way to express their desire was through writing there are many things that you uh, that are, are best drawn in sketches and sometimes yeah. they are they are made into uh, elaborate um, yeah. elaborate drawings where you actually begin to i think the you know the way you you draw you are thinking and drawing mm. uh, as you're doing this uh, yeah. uh but the thinking drawing is something for yourself mm. you, know, you do it as as a uh, uh, not as a past time yeah. but your own thoughts are achieving a certain clarity yes when you are putting them down on paper yeah. and uh, so I, so i think that drawing is very important as a personal documentation mm. which you yeah. which you do as someone say if i was left alone in a small mountain area somewhere and i only had a 10 rupee note to draw on and there was a pen inside my pocket mm. would i be able to express <clears throat> myself yeah uh, without a computer uh, <laughs> so i think those things are what makes uh, yeah. makes hand drawing important uh, yeah We had the idea with four fresh graduates to make an exhibition where we would take the lang- demystify architect. Reverty uh being who she was, uh, I think she listened to me. She had a few questions and then she said, "I think this is a fantastic idea." And then she said something very interesting. 
she said, I'm going to make a drawing for that exhibition. And I had seen her work. She mm. draws beautifully. Mm. And she made a huge drawing. And in that drawing, you know, it was at least, you know, one and a half by maybe one and a half meter, something like that. One drawing that explains the whole project. Where the things got resources from, how the wind movement is, what the structure of the building is. Mm. Amazing drawing, mm. a piece of art, but also very much kind of communicative. Yeah. So that became, you know, it became the centerpiece of exhibition because it was amazing. Blown away. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of drawings, but mm. that was uber category, yeah. so to say. And then you realize that huh, what you say that you sometimes make a drawing to sell it, you sometimes make a drawing for yourself, sometimes you make... She had the ability to put everything in one drawing. Mm. It partly was for herself, it partly was to explain the project or I don't know, sell it. Uh, I don't think she was particularly interested in selling, but uh, communicate it. And with that drawing, you could actually build the project. So that is like, wow, yeah, fantastic. That, that is amazing because yeah. I, I think there is, that's where, uh, you know, the ability to, to um, you know, transcend the medium completely yeah. and to do something which is entirely your own, you know, mm. you, you're not making, you, or you're making a working drawing, a sketch yeah. and an idea all in one. Uh, yeah. And I, I think this was something I uh, had seen uh, when I was living in, in uh, in America, we went to see the Vietnam uh, Memorial yep. Exhibition. I was a student uh, there at that time, and yep. we had uh, uh, the, the whole exhibition. It was an open exhibition to uh, to anybody who wanted to participate. Yep. Uh, so it was not just architects. It was uh, you know if you were a, a yep. business executive and you had an idea for the Vietnam Memorial, you could put that in yep. also. Yeah. So the um, this exhibition was in the uh, was in a hangar uh, building, a uh, U.S. Air Force hangar somewhere, yeah. and it was uh, in Washington. But uh, um, it was so large that you literally had to wade through thousands and thousands of projects just to, yeah. and everybody wanted to be a professional architect. Uh, yeah. You know, it had to be made uh, first explained on the left side yeah. of a sketch as an idea so and you could see that the sketch was made after the uh, after the <laughs> you know the, the idea had already been executed yeah. Yeah. and then the details of how the building would develop and uh, yeah. uh, then a, an exonometric a, a perspective from the top and yeah. all uh, and so you go through through all this and then you see something which uh, has been done as a little watercolor sketch uh, and with a with a little pen explanation yep. as to what was important about the monument yep. and it, the explanation was literally you know three or four lines uh, yep. and the watercolor sketch also I think she had dropped her uh, coffee on it so <laughs> it had smudged a little bit uh, <laughs> But it was, you know, almost you could see instinctively yeah. that this yeah. was a person who had thought very seriously about yeah. the the idea of a memorial and what what it meant. Yeah. And so, I mean, it it was uh, just yeah. natural that it be be picked out. Uh, so maybe this should be organized for the Central Vista. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if Central. it's of if it's of national importance, I guess it yes. should take time for it. No? Well, Central Vista is obviously not of, of uh, national importance. Uh. The history of architecture and architectural education, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I, I've, I've worked five years in London, um, so I know the British system quite well. Unfortunately, the way of, let's say, how the Russians or how the French do architecture has never really trickled down to India. Um, and that's a pity, because I think you have such an amazing, I sometimes call India a continent, uh, rather than a country, uh, because you have such an amazing variety of 
people, landscapes, cultures, uh, you know, the sort of richness in that variety. You can have 15 different schools of architecture in your country. You bring in the Japanese and bring in the Danish and bring in whatever, uh, uh, wherever it needs to come from. But if you stick to the French and the, and the, and the Russians, the Russians obviously, they are very much, let's say, engineer architects. Mm. So the engineering of the building and to be sure that there is a certain rigidness and a robustness and, and things like that in uh, uh, what is being built uh, is very important for the Russians. Hey, if you look at deconstructivism, to take the idea of Russian architecture kind of apart, uh, this also traces down not to Frankie uh, O'Geary and, and a couple of other people. This is long uh, Russian Revolution mm -hmm. and, and, and when Malevich and Elisinsky started to uh, work with suprem uh, suprematism, yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. etc. So I think in that sense the engineers of India definitely embraced, let's say, the Russian school. Uh, America was knocking on the door too hard, so India and Russia were very kind of good friends. But I think for the architects, they almost felt that because the engineers are taking already so much credits and they are part of building the nation and, and what is our position, they kind of a little bit British or Anglo-Saxon way did X, Y or Z, but um, if let's say the French and the Beaux-Arts where the architect is seen as an artist, mm. uh, where you're not afraid in doing controversial questioning, that's the job of an artist almost. And so that side of hardcore uh, engineering and uh, maybe the, the softer side of, of artistic expression and those kind of things, if you merge that, then you get architecture. Because uh, if you go to Auroville, which definitely has a kind of um, French, German kind of background, it's a completely different way of doing things. Mm -hmm. If you go to Chantiniquetan, uh, where, yeah, there are buildings, but, uh, you know, I, I still find it such a pity that Tagore was not able, with all his wisdom and all his visionary ideas, etc., to get a whole bunch of young architects in a team there and make something new, something yeah. amazing. It's really pitchy patchy kind of a little bit colonial, but a little bit, it's actually, you know, it's it's a bit of a kitchery. Yeah, to indeed, be honest. it's something which has always baffled me because you know, missed opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think absolutely because I think there's a um, what has happened is that the uh, there've been very clear definitions of a rural model and an urban model, mm. but Tagore was in a way uh, oh, would have yeah. created a suburban model. Yeah. Laurie Baker suddenly thinking about, you know, you would not install air conditioners mm. at that moment mm. in time. And that is now the, the fallback scenario. You make a bad building and then yeah. you put an air conditioning inside. Um, but he needed space and he needed air and he needed yeah. cross ventilation. So then some people say, oh, look at this beautiful Jali and he's made it like this and that and that. Yes, mm. it needs to be open, otherwise <laughs> the wind is not going through. Yes. <laughs> you can't make a solid wall. Yeah. It's not going to do the job. True, that's true. He, I, I think that's where he, in a way, he also lucked out because he got such a variety of clients there. Yeah. Uh, and they were all... Uh, they were all very willing clients because within their budgets they managed to get what they wanted, yeah. and uh, and and I think Baker was uh, was open to to any kind of plan. Yeah. I think so much of what you see in his buildings is that they move around in in a whole range of lyrical yeah. uh, ideas, and part part of it, of course, comes from him because he. Uh, I think he was much more of an artist than he, he is acknowledged actually because uh, 
there are interesting ways in which he light comes in and all that and and light was never really discussed Corbusier would not ask the fathers of uh, Ronchamp mm. if they would be very interested in uh, a specific uh, color pattern mm. or mm. that you would have a wall thickness and a window sill that is kind of deeply penetrating you know mm. Th these questions are not being asked so for Corbusier to get Chandigarh and to get uh, to work on uh, with maximum freedom yeah. on and, and, and the mill, mill owners building arguably I mean I'm not a big Corbusier fan mm. but that mill owners building wow that is arguably I would say one of his best buildings mm. he had ultimate freedom he could do whatever he did as long as he sticked in the budget because that was important for the Gujaratis <laughs> <laughs> So that also means that, so what is, what is good for an architect? Mm. Is it good to have a clear brief? Is it good to have a clear budget? Is it good to have those kind of things? Zaha huh? I, I, uh, I went to see her building in Weil am Rhein and the first uh, fire brigade mm. building. The fire brigade gave up after one and a half year. And they say nothing is working in this building. Mm. We can't drive our cars in, the showers are leaking. Uh, if we go in the changing room, people from outside can see us. This is a horrible building mm. as a fire brigade station. It doesn't work. Yeah? If you go there today, it's a, I mean, the architecture is gorgeous. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm. It's spectacular. And where she starts actually building for the first time. And it's a gallery mm. for chairs. Vitra chairs, and it's beautiful, and it works like nothing else. So, once upon a time, fire brigade station. <laughs> yeah. So then, is Hadid a really bad architect? Because she didn't understand anything of how to make a functional building? Or is she a visionary person who was able to make something that could be anything? If they would ask us, would you like to live in that building? I would say yes. Mm. So it's a residential building. <laughs> yeah. It's a gallery. It's a, but it's not a fire brigade station. <laughs> uh, there's a French, I admire him very much. Nobody knows him in India, but in France, he's a big guy. He advises the government. His name is Patrick Bouchon. And Patrick Bouchon has I was in a discussion with him in Paris uh, and he basically said, I do not, as an architect, make any new buildings anymore because we have enough buildings. Mm -hmm. Our role as architects is to be the curator of the spaces that we already have. Like you mentioned, I think almost one third of housing, new housing in Delhi is, uh, is lying vacant and it's owned by people who already have a house. You know, so need to be far more innovative in, in the use of space. And, uh, and what we, we see right now is the misuse of, of space. Uh, you know, there are, there are two people living in a 12 acre farmhouse and there are 12 people living in a, in a single, single room somewhere. So can can the can we have a more equitable society? Can we have and can architecture actually make something which becomes a a lesson for the future? It's a it's a, it's a hard hard question for architects to answer. But uh, if you see the amount of empty cube meters in Connor Place, it's shocking. Whole buildings completely empty structures that are stuck into legal disputes or those kind of things, completely empty. So I think the law or perhaps the laws or maybe legal requirements could be a beginning of looking at how does India, how does the government of India, what do they think about empty buildings? Because it's not that if you make a law that tomorrow India will change, 
But if you don't have that law, it will certainly not change. It's not that nobody gets raped and nobody gets murdered, but the moment that you have completely lawlessness, the chances that more of that would happen is very much there, right? So this is out of, I would say, the realm of practicing architects or, or whatever, but this would be very much into a larger discussion that needs to include the government. Now, is the government ready to have this discussion? And who is the government? Minister and some of his advisors, that maybe it would not be a bad idea for Utrecht to come up with basic guide, guiding principles of how to make buildings in higher altitude. Mm. This building is at 2,800 meters. So that means in the winter time you have a meter of snow mm. and that means temperatures drop below zero, you have freezing and uh, you have permafrost on the floor and you have uh, melting of ice and snow in detail your building in a different way. So if this is the altitude, um, don't make your building like this that you have a lot of closure and a little bit of an opening towards the morning sun. Make it like this. It's called passive solar energy. You design your building in such a way that your building invites the morning sun on. If you have double glazing, which is this principle, very simple. If it's really cold, do double glazing. If it's really hot, do double glazing. If you have a temperate climate like Bangalore, you can do single glazing, no problem. Um, but you invite the sun in, and the sun is a natural heating system. Because at that altitude, yeah. your carbon footprint to bring petrol all the way up to 2,800 meters is irresponsible. Nobody will measure the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. The forest department, who is my client, they would never ask for a carbon footprint kind of analysis of this building. But I believe in this and my team so it follows the sun actually. The, yes. The glazing follows the sun. Yes. And so it's almost like a greenhouse. So, uh, and then it's not strict to the north, but a little bit more towards the east, about 20 degrees, and so that morning sun kind of low angle peeps in, especially in the winter when you need it. Uh, um, and, so, and it's free, at least, you know, let's hope that the sun will keep on coming up every day. Uh, I, I'm not uh, in charge of that department. <laughs> if you enter the building, you don't go in directly, you have a sluice, either outside the building or inside the building, uh, because if this is let's say 14 degrees and outside is minus 5 degrees and you go directly in, there's a lot of energy yeah. that goes out. Especially if you walk in with five people because the door will be open for a long period of time. If you build something in a, hot, in a cold climate, don't use double height space. No. This is fantastic in Sri Lanka. This is fantastic in Kerala. This is mm -hmm. fantastic in no, uh, you know, you need air, but not here, mm. so you close it. Uh, this is another one. Huh, that why do people in the mountains always wear a hat? Because the maximum heat that you lose goes through your head. So if you put a hat on, you're instantly yeah. comfortable. So do that for the building. Hat and shoes. Both yes. Both don't, together. Yes. <laughs> don't make a stupid corrugated steel sheet because you'll have condensation problems. The steel sheet will be cold on the outside right, because the sky in the night, uh, people are inside or maybe cooking, you have condensation. You will have rain inside your building. I've seen buildings in Ladakh. We've done two projects in Ladakh. Sometimes they've done it in such a bad way that the, the whole building is wet inside. Mm -hmm because of the condensation. If you make windows in the roof or whatever, make small ones. Mm. You get a little bit of daylight in, you have a bit of an orientation. If the moon is up, you get a bit of moonlight into your building, but don't make big ones, because again, you, you lose the heat. Yeah. No, it does get hot there also. The yeah, it's not so, uh, I don't know if somehow with the forest department, I don't know if they're gonna do it or not, if we could make a small guideline Guiding Principles, ABC, by mm. your book of, mm. uh, of Laurie Baker. Mm. I think it has inspired so many people. Mm. 
because they don't know what is retrobot. Yeah. They really don't know. 